Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining. We're just allowing a few of you to, to join, give it a couple of minutes to let you in and uh, we'll get underway. Right, I think I'm going to be stuck with you here, aren't I? <laughs> yes, with additional cats as well for uh, for company. It's just, a, well, it is a white cat, it's been so long under the lamp, it's changed colour. <laughs> ah. And it's quite funny, we had Russian television around the other week, and uh, they were actually filming here, and they were convinced they have all their Russian blues. Um, and of course, they're actually Burmese, but as far as they're concerned, they can have what they want. <laughs> um, but it's quite funny, the interview was actually of nothing of any particular interest whatsoever. But in fact, it turned out there was more filming of the cat than there was of me. <laughs> put, put, the, put the ratings up, I suspect. All right, we'll just give it one more minute and uh, we'll get started. Thanks for joining everyone. Josh, let's get going. Right, great. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Justin. Thanks for joining. Justin, if you want to uh, kick off and uh, yeah, let's get underway. Thank you very much. Uh, Josh, thank you very much indeed. Well, good afternoon and welcome, everybody. And uh, hopefully you're going to find an interesting hour uh, on a particular subject we're dealing with. And this is equity. Uh, who deserves a slice of the pie and how much should they get? And can they handle it? Um, so there's a very vital uh, subject at the moment because uh, you look at other types of investments at the moment, like the bond market, not looking wildly attractive. Plus the fact, equity is one of those subjects where not necessarily people are very well versed as to actually what it is, what you do with it, um, and where the benefits or the risks are with it as well. So we're going to spend our time, an hour, going through this, uh, but it'll be also be very dependent upon questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question. You get stupid answers. Those are normally from me. Um, but uh, pleased to say we've got more expert people than I here to actually cover those. So please do fire them away. They'll, they'll come through electronically and I'll pick them up. If you don't want to be uh, named, be anonymous, please say so. And uh, we'll swap money later on so I don't relieve it. Um, so with all of that, and by the way, I do apologize in advance. If you are allergic to cats, remember it's a Zoom call, so they shouldn't come out in hives. Um, so my uh, Burmese cats will uh, sadly make an appearance every so often, which is uh, rather annoying, but I can't throw them out because they make even more noise outside. So let's press on. Pleased to introduce, first of all, Ifti Nasir. And I'm sure you've got some background notes uh, on him anyway, but let me just highlight here. Founder and CEO, CEO of Vested the UK's number one share scheme platform. He will explain more about that, I'm sure. Um, and uh, so with all that he's been able to produce, is a strong believer in the ownership effect um, and uh, advises businesses on how to share equity to incentivize teams and unlock value. An entrepreneur since his teens and an entrepreneur in the global energy industry, if he reached the most senior levels at BP and ESA Energy and decided to actually have better companies, so set up his own, much better idea. doing it. His mission uh, is to effectively then transform uh, the shareholder world, currently dominated by cash, to one more reflective of contribution made through human endeavor, energy, and hard work. Yes, quite right too. I say some of the people I come across, distinct impression, they can't actually spell either of them, let alone do it. Also then, uh, Oliver Blackwell, MCSD, founder and CEO, see we only gave the top people here, none of this rubbish, uh, of clinical design. Oliver is a multi-award winning product and experienced designer and an accredited member of the Chartered Society of Designers. Um, since 2005, he's worked with commercial and government organizations, as well as winner of the Red Dot Award 2019, and, quite a lot of awards. I won't necessarily go through them, but if you are interested, I'll add them on later by all means, but be impressed, he's got a lot of them. Oliver was trained in design thinking by former IDEO designer, Roberto Fracelli, and frequently delivers engaging lectures for business schools. Have you, did I say get a business school, they don't normally do engaging lectures, nor new ones to lay, lay, make you go have a decent sleep for a while. So that's a nice change. So actually, therefore, here are two gentlemen uh, to go through this subject. By the way, I must also apologise, my screen will go in and out of focus. Um, that's because I'm probably moving around too much. I'll try and keep still. Um, it's nothing to do with the alcoholic intake because uh, I stopped me getting uh, fuzzy. It's the system. 
So without any more ado, what we're going to have is start off with Ifti, who's going to give us his intro to what he actually wants to highlight of this. Uh, and then we'll go to Oliver after that. Um, and we'll pick up points. And this is where I need your questions coming through. I've got a lot, a lot as well. Um, so first of all, let's press on. Ifti, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Justin. And good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, just picking up on um, Justin's point there as to who we are, we're vested. Uh, we were incorporated back in 2014, uh, the world's, uh, sorry, world's, the UK's first digital platform for share schemes and equity management for startups and SMEs. Uh, and I would say this, wouldn't I, but uh, easily still the best. Um, again, as Justin mentioned, you know, Vested was founded on the whole principle of the ownership effect. Um, uh, this is research that was done back in the 80s. Uh, and it's a philosophy that um, your relationship with a, a company changes if you hold equity or shares in it. However small that holding might be, your relationship changes emotionally, psychologically. What you bring to the table changes as a consequence. So just keep that in mind as we go through, um, uh, through this little conversation just now and, and as we go into discussion later on. Um, when it comes to equity, most pe uh, and, and businesses, most people will be very clear that you know, success doesn't just come from uh, um, a, a founder or a few directors making all, all the money. Success actually comes from the team and the endeavors and contributions of the team. And today's teams are very different to, to the past. It's not just a, a founder and a, a bunch of employees. Today's teams uh, are a cast of characters from contractors to consultants, NEDs and advisors. And yes, part of the team is actually the investor. The investors uh, are very important. Not much happens uh, without that cash. And I think that's something that uh, our friends at Regionally are going to be uh, helping a lot more folk uh, get access to uh, over time. But if you've got this cast of characters, each one of them will have a different way or you will have, need a different way to reward each one of them. When it comes to those who are investing their cash, yeah, I know that Vested was built to make sure that it's not just about cash that we, we look after. But those who bring their cash to the table, they're important, as I mentioned, and it's quite easy to reward them. You either give them ordinary shares if they're early stage investors or it's a very simple uh, organization. Or if you're going through investment rounds and you've got more sophisticated angel investors or private equity or VCs involved, then there may be pref structures or preference shares available. We won't go into too much detail on those, but suffice to know that they're, they're pretty straightforward and we can help you handle all of those. It's the non-cash uh, in, uh, investment that um, we're going to focus on a, a little bit now. And non-cash in, investment can be rewarded in many ways. Obviously, there's that, that first way, which is no shares at all. But then there's that the, the more powerful ones where you're getting people engaged, you're accessing that, that ownership effect. The most common uh, tools uh, are, are options. That's basically the opportunity to buy shares at some point in the future at a pre-agreed price based on certain delivery. And there are two main types here. One is uh, something like an EMI, an enterprise management incentive, which has a beautiful tax wrapper around it so that any growth that a, um, a, a recipient may receive uh, on, on those options, let's say they start at £1, they go to £10, that £9 of growth, they'll only have to pay 10% 10 uh, 10 tax on. So it's brilliant. And from a company perspective, they can offset that whole growth against corporation tax. So the HMRC, HMRC have done a great job in, in creating and maintaining that particular scheme. Unapproved options, although they hold, they hold a, 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 the same name, are very, very different. Unapproved options, when you exercise the option, i.e. turn the, the opportunity to buy those shares into actual shares, that transaction and any value uh, in that is seen as a, a capital gain. Uh, sorry, uh, as, a, uh, as in, uh, effectively income. So you'll pay your marginal income tax rate on that. So if you're a 40 or 45% taxpayer, you'll pay 40 to 45% on that uh, nine pound growth that we talked about earlier. So although they're very similar names, very, very different in terms of reward. The other uh, tool that's out there and available is what's known as a growth share. 
whereby somebody gets the, a share with a hurdle, the hurdle being the current share price uh, and a small premium, such that they don't get any of the value in the shares when they receive the, the shares. So there's no tax liability when you receive it. But anything that grows in that value is then a capital gain. So subject to only 20% tax. So obviously the, with this range of different tools um, to, to deploy and that different casts of character, you can imagine that uh, managing all this stuff can get really uh, expensive, complicated, and seriously mess with your, with your head. <laughs> and so uh, vested, as I say, is here to help take away the cost and complexity and just make this whole notion of sharing equity accessing that ownership effect, helping getting your team to bring as much to the table as they, they possibly can, uh, as easy uh, as possible. Uh, and if you want to uh, some help with this, you can have a free consultation. Uh, just um, uh, tap in vested.com uh, and you'll find us there, or you can drop us a, an email on hello at vested. And with that, I'll hand over back to Justin. Thank you very much. If you thank you for that, and raising some very important parts, I really have gone blurry again, haven't I? Um, and some very important points there. And it's just a classic phrase I remember dealing with a company secretary of a quite a well-known British bank. And his view was shareholders, the bane of my life. It just to me just underlined the ignorance of uh, lack of imagination and frankly stupidity um, of people dealing with shareholders and particularly large companies as to what benefits they are. And it just shows you Actually, not, they have never considered what the benefit and use of shareholders is going to be. So uh, if you read some great points there, we can come back to those in, in a bit more detail. So then let's move over. And uh, then Oliver, can we hear your pitch, please? Thank you, Justin. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, as Justin's kindly made the introduction, I'm a, very much a product designer by background um, and very much by mistake have found myself um, in specialising in, in the medical device sector. So I'm the founder and CEO of Clinical Design. We're a, a legal, our legal entity is a, is a medical device manufacturing company. However, we find ourselves very much as a software company. And this is where the great value of our technology comes, comes into play. So we're the world's only closed urine test. And as Justin kindly mentioned, we've won the top two design awards in the world with our, with our technology. And really the reason that we've won those awards is because it's so simple and intuitive to use. And I've got the technology here, which I'll just give you a demonstration at the end of the presentation. Um, my background as a product designer actually makes me quite well placed to design medical devices. So where I, where I specialize is, is a process called human centered design. And what that actually means is I go into a clinical setting, I make a number of observations, challenge current practice, human behavior, develop something in, in, in my, my experience, that's something physical. Um, you present it back to those individuals, test it and see what they think. And then it's a very much an iterative process and allows you to develop some technology that actually is designed very much for that application. I was, um, in fact, I was telling Ifti the story of, of, of clinical design at, at, before the call, and um, it all started with um, a pot of infected urine uh, being knocked into somebody's keyboard on a Monday morning. And very much that opened my eyes as to uh, the, the, the process of urinalysis and actually what, what urine testing is. And it, and, it, and it transpires, it's a very old process developed by the Egyptians. Um, and it happens that it happens to be the most common medical test in the world. It is a really good test at um, inexpensively identifying a number of things from early stage cancers, kidney disease, urinary tract infections, diabetes, and, and that list very much does go on. You probably all had a urine test. So to put it into perspective, there's about uh, over 120 million urine tests undertaken in the UK every year. So there's actually about 2.8 billion globally. So for that reason, it is the, the number one point of care test. Um, and as I say, it's quick, inexpensive, and can really help a clinician form a diagnosis of, of that particular patient. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see um, 56 different colors. And the current process of manual reading urine involves dipping a stick into urine, holding a chart up, and then you've got to accurately read a urine-soaked stick against all of those colors, reading 
specific colors at specific times in order to get the correct diagnosis. Upon completion and actually waiting the full two minutes to get the correct results of leukocytes, you then have to memorize 10 results and write them down of which most of them have actually got numerical values. As you can appreciate, this is a tricky task. And it's for this reason that the test is often done inaccurately. And more importantly, information is not completed fully in the patient's electronic record, which can then latterly be gone back and investigated. So let me tell you about urine testing system. Urine testing system consists of three key items. The UTS-10 cap, this is a consumable item, one cap per urine test. The UTS digital analyzer, this is a calibrated medical device that sits on the doctor's desk, or it could sit in a hospital ward, or it could also sit in a nursing or a care home setting. It analyzes the colors of the chemical change using a process called reflectance photometry. And then the information is displayed on the UTS desktop software, at which point the information can then be interrogated, shared digitally with other clinicians. It's then pasted onto a dashboard where trends can be identified. If I'm to give you a very simple example, we were made aware of a patient in the Torbay area in the southwest, whereby they had manual urine dipstick tests. And the information of blood being present in their urine was just noted in the general script of the patient's electronic notes. What that actually meant was that when the patient came back six weeks later, the next doctor was unable to actually find those blood results. That patient then transpired to have, 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 have a cancer, which could have actually been caught and treated that much earlier. So this is one of the things that we actually do by tracking those trends. We can really flag it to the healthcare professional. So where do we sit? So with the world's only closed urine test, we're the lowest cost digital solution available in the market. And we're really interested in the value that you get from big data. Imagine 120 million tests and there's 10 bits of information associated with it. Suddenly the aggregation of that information is, is really interesting to higher healthcare systems, as well as on a micro level and actually the patient's own interest. So we're an interesting business. We're fundamentally a manufacturing business, hence my background as a product designer. Um, so we manufacture, we have the technical know-how and the intellectual property on how to put our equipment together. We manufacture in the UK. We have the equipment, which is both the consumable and the analyzer. And then the, the complete link to that circle is the health data with our desktop software. Hopefully that gives you a, quick, a very quick snapshot. Um, I will show you your intestine. As you can see, it's a very small, compact. This is the UTS-10 cap. It goes into the analyzer and then the top is placed on. And then after two minutes, the results appear on the screen. So it's a delightfully simple product to use. And it's for that reason that we, um, we believe we'll have great commercial success. We're working with regionally doing a fundraise at present, which is going very well. Um, and we're very much at the point where the business is going, growing from our end of our R&D phase now to very much expansion into the, into the commercial realms. So hopefully that was of interest and look forward to your questions later on. Thank you. Oliver, thank you, thank you very much indeed for that. Somehow that, uh, that uh, skit of uh, Ronnie Barker uh, being asked to actually fill up a, a urine sample comes to mind in Porridge when asked to fill it up, what from here? as he was standing on the other side of the room. Uh, that is very unfair, although I apologise, uh, because it's uh, uh, extremely, uh, not, it is, it's not extremely useful and vital, but you're, it was the design bit, it was the, uh, the uh, elegance, I think is the right word, of what you had designed. I know we can't really see it very clearly there, just on screen, um, so people have to take my word for it. So here you are, Oliver, in the position, you're going through a, a fundraise at the moment, and you've already uh, have been through um, other variations of this. Um, what sort of shareholders do you actually want to have? It's really interesting that point because um, we have we have a number of small investors, we have a number of large high net worths, we also have some commercial funds involved in the business. Over the years, I've become very astute in leveraging that skill set within the business. Um, and I know of recent, my chairman is heavily involved in the business, both as, as a shareholder and, and obviously representing the shareholders. I would say that of my shareholders, I actively engage with a, a very large proportion and I utilize their strong networks, their technical capabilities, their business background, their resources. And I've even recently actually taken on a shareholding for someone who's going to invest in terms of services rather than the cash investment. So I like to think that we do leverage that. And it was funny in speaking with IFTI earlier, really a number of options that he said I had informally we were already doing, but it was actually, he, he highlighted that point to me. I think it's actually fascinating because uh, certainly when I go to, uh, 
talks of the business schools and such like, I find a lot of terribly old fashioned in their attitude towards it, normally having spoken to investment bankers and such like, in that uh, investment bankers buy them with the money, yes, they're shareholders, but you know, actually they just want the money, not the shareholders. Um, whereas what you're describing there is something which is much more designed um, and uh, something which we used to see before, when we, we actually started AIM about 30 years ago, actually it's up in Glasgow, and, and then quite deliberately making sure you had the right shareholders for the right companies. Um, so I find it absolutely fascinating. So let, let's just move on. Ifti, you've seen what uh, Oliver's done there. Is that the same sort of way you'd go about this or how would you advise it? Um, I, I think the, the way Oliver's gone about it and recognising that there's a lot of people who um, have, uh, uh, are going to be contributing to the success of the enterprise and making sure that they have some form of skin in the game is brilliant. And as, yeah, he, he's there before us. One of the challenges is that not always are those structures put in place uh, compliant with law or, or indeed watertight from a quid pro quo perspective, because clearly if you give shares after the event, then any growth or contribution that you made that helped it right, raise in value, you won't get the benefit of that, or you'll be paying tax for, for the benefit of that. Whereas if you give the shares too early on and the people then don't deliver, then it gets very complicated pulling the shares back. So one of the things that we make sure is done that those sorts of transactions that Oliver was talking about can be done safely without all the, the costs, as I mentioned earlier. And so that when the quid pro quo com, comes to pass, both parties feel safe and the value that um, should be ascribed to the person who brought their, their endeavor or contribution to the game is, is maximized. So what happens then, because presumably as the business changes, the need for different shareholders change as well. Uh, your startup uh, people who are willing to take the risk uh, may be very helpful, but as you get larger, probably not so helpful because they're possibly trying to be more aggressive. Um, I'm making that up. There are all sorts of variations. I'm not saying how do you fire shareholders, but how do you develop your shareholder base as your business changes? Yeah. So obviously, as you grow, if, if we look at just the, the uh, capital, the cash investors, they will change definitely without question. Early stage uh, investors have a much higher risk appetite. There are different tax structures to, to help them take that appetite without a, with a, um, a level of uh, safety net. Um, so SEIS, EIS, uh, VCT uh, are all there to, to help those early stage um, investors. As you go up the evolutionary curve of the business, people will, those guys who want a high risk, high reward game may chip out and then they will want to sell or, or take their, their cash out in some way or another and then go and carry on investing elsewhere. Those people who want to take those shares are probably people who are more happy with uh, lower risk and lower reward. When it comes to individuals, uh, and we talk about people bringing their endeavor and the reward that you give for that, yeah, it, it changes massively as well. Those who are joining you at the very early stage of a, a journey, they're taking a massive risk. Uh, you know, more than nine out of 10 companies will fail. Yeah. Uh, and so as a consequence, you know, that's a massive hit. There's virtually no um, safety net for those guys. And so a much higher reward is generally put on the table. And that diminishes us again, just as with the, uh, the conversation we were talking about uh, in, in terms of uh, others, uh, any business as, as they grow. As they become more mature, they become less risk, and therefore the reward uh, proportion changes. So there's an issue here then, because in days gone by, forgive me uh, for uh, going on an old area, which, uh, uh, but the number of stock exchanges you had in this country after the war were actually 45 stock exchanges, which were useless, most of them. But there were seven regional exchanges. And it did mean there was a mechanism for shareholders to exit in the regions um, and be able to do so, not in a terribly liquid market, but by matched orders or various different ways of going about it. In this position, as we don't seem to have those regional markets anymore and AIM isn't operating very successfully, how do, your share, how do you get your shareholders to move? Can they get out? Um, do you provide a mechanism for them or you just say to them, look, you're locked in until X time? So the, the platform allows for people to sell their shares. What you're talking about is actually a, something that doesn't yet exist, which is a, a liquid market. Yes, there are a number of people looking at how such a market might evolve. And indeed, we're part of that uh, 
conversation talking to a, a, a number of uh, uh, counterparties uh, um, um, ways in which this would, would work um, but that liquid market is not there yet there is the mechanisms through through vested to be able to easily move those shares on between you know existing shareholders to subsequent uh, shareholders um, but the uh, marketplace it is very much in the evolutionary phase at the moment lots of different ways it might come to pass and indeed, as I say, you can intra-company marketplaces probably are already there effectively by by virtue of of vested uh, existing. But the 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 ability to buy and sell in many many businesses is is still evolving. Well, it's funny because actually even you don't go actually even in the FTSE 250 there are various stocks there which are quite barren and very difficult to try and trade. Unfortunately, the people often trying to manage the liquidity are the people or trying to actually manage it. Um, it's talk against their own book sometimes uh, because they try and maintain a price of a, of a small share, uh, which is it, uh, it, frankly illogical because it doesn't have a valuation until you can actually get a proper price that someone trades at. Um, so I think it's often the, the city itself is sometimes its worst enemy when you don't look at those sort of things. Um, tell me then, what's your view in terms of, uh, it ties in with this, long-term share ownership. We're all keen to try and make sure that there's longer-term investors, but equally investors want to get out. But we've got a tax system which doesn't really benefit that um, and sort of seems to work against it. Uh, what should companies be trying to do to try and make sure uh, they've got those longer term ones? Um, companies or uh, companies. investors, um, punters, yeah, I, I guess very early stage, the SEIS and EIS investors do have a lot of uh, support from uh, HMRC. Um, you know, if they, they for investing in early stage businesses that they will get a, a tax rebate um, and then if the company fails they will get a further uh, tax rebate so they're pretty cushioned using those sorts of tools as are venture capitalists but as you as you go on then you know it, it's about your own risk appetite as to whether you're um you're going to take on the um you know the businesses like um you know olivers and the others that, that you'll be working with on on regionally but it's about educating people giving them sharing enough information with them to have a view of what the company is up to where it's going and creating that um, notional demand but the ease of transaction is there it's about making sure that people understand what they're doing rather than just be conned into um you know lots of fake stories and you know from the south sea bubble to some of the um, cryptocurrencies that are play, doing the rounds at the moment. There's a lot of uh, risk um, uh, out there, uh, and I think part of the the opening up of the markets, or the re whether it's regional markets, whether it's the more transparent uh, secondary markets for um, investment stocks, uh, it's going to be around how well we communicate and how well we let people understand the risks that they're taking. One of the problems we found is not just for companies, but for investors as well, there's barely any education on it. People also have to learn by pain to establish actually what's the right way and wrong way to go about it. My concern is actually with the, often the hair out of the exchanges, stock exchanges around the world, generally is still too short term. Equity investment would normally be regarded as a five to seven year issue. In terms of private equity, that's normally three years and too short. Yeah. Um, uh, Oliver, when you were looking at your funding structure, would it not have been easy with a, with a business like yours, with a great design, an obvious market, and you're leading it there? Um, did you did you need to have those shareholders? And why couldn't you? You probably could have gone for a, probably a higher valuation um, or a higher, quicker move with private equity or venture capitalists. Would that all have been easier for you? Um, I think as a small company that started off in the medical device sector, it would have been very difficult to attract at that early stage. So we needed to originally go for, for, high, for traditional angel high net worth um, investors. As the business has grown, then obviously we've, we've, we've moved to more family funds, more institutional investors, and we'll carry on in, in ultimately quite a traditional, traditional way forward, I believe. But um, what's interesting is, should the business have actually had its um, more of its software digital element at the early phases, because that is something that's come latterly over the years, then it would have had a much higher valuation early on and therefore could have perhaps attracted a, a, a more serious investor, shall we say, a more of an institutional investor. 
Um, how do you find when you were obviously looking to uh, design this, not only the product, but the company, um, where did you go to for corporate advice? And what was your view of what you found there? I mean, traditionally we've used we've been used normal lawyers and accountants accountants on that, Justin, but it's um it is all very, it is very, very difficult. And I mean, I, I can, um, we have a member of staff, a very senior new member of staff joining the business and re is replacing someone who's retired. And it's a very difficult scenario because that person that's retired has done a number of years service and, and is entitled to a, an equity share for that as part of a, um, a growth scheme. Um, but likewise, the new individual we're trying to incentivize has come from a, a very strong, strong high salaried position to work for ultimately a relatively high risk um, new new medical device company. So actually, that's when you you trait. How do you value those two? One is exiting, but has, has has put the sweat equity in. Another one is, and you need to incentivize them. So that's a really interesting dynamic that we that, w that we've we've uh, discussed internally. And I, I most certainly welcome um, if these comments on that actually. If you, what about this in terms of making sure you got the right ones and that the quality of the advice coming from the corporate side to me they often seem sort of rather behind the, the, the circle with this yeah i mean yeah there, there's a couple of things firstly those who have already contributed their endeavor yeah, the, the business wouldn't be where it is now oliver had it not been for for that individual uh, and it's a, a mark of a, a an honorable organization to recognize that and let them take what they have created or contributed to away with them because one of the things about equity is that even if they've moved on, if they are holding your paper, if they're holding your shares, they will remain vested in your success forever. And whether it's advocacy, whether it's promotion, so let people take what they have earned, uh, I think is um, certainly a, a, a firm philosophy uh, of mine. In terms of the new guys, it is a different equation. And therefore, and there are lots of um, uh, uh, lots of work that's been done around how to distribute, how to reward based on certain deliverables, rather than just here's the here are the shares and um, uh, and on off you go. So we, we can certainly help you in terms of structuring the appropriate um, uh, reward distribution over time, but it will be different, it, and it may even be less than that person who's walking away. But it's about recognizing the, the, um, the contribution that was made. It's just like with a, an early stage investor, they may put in a, a very small amount of money, but had it not been for that, it wouldn't have existed. So, you know, two, three years down the line for the you know, same amount of money, you'll have to give a, you know, a tenth of the shares maybe. So it's just recognizing that and just not getting confused uh, in our own minds of, um, oh, well, that, that seems like a lot. Seems like a lot, but that was the deal when you agreed the, the, the deal. And if the person has fulfilled their obligation, it, it's only fair to let them uh, take the reward that they've helped create. I think it's an interesting word you said there, uh, uh, advocates, because I've often been um, surprised that companies don't make more use of their shareholders no. as their primary advocates. You know, they own the come part of the company um, and they may have other involvements with them. And yet somehow, again, it's that push away. Oh, they're shareholders. Well, that's, that's not like with us. It, yeah, I mean, it's massive. I mean, you will hear a lot of old school um, investors and even founders thinking, yeah, this is my equity. I'm just going to hold on to all of it. Yeah, they, 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 they made the money. They put in the money early. They put in the endeavor early. They took a lot of risk. They should have a, a decent reward. But recognizing that everybody who's helped them on that journey is worthy of some of it has often been frowned upon. And so, you know, keep your cap table tight, just give it to, to people who are giving you cash, you know, a handful of uh, uh, investors or just people who are putting in cash. Historically, that, that made sense because also it was complicated keeping all the, the shareholders up to date and ma managing them with the tools that we've created. That bit of it is easy as pie. And so now it's about making sure that those who, who, who contribute should be able to have, have a share. And if you think about it, if everybody in the organization is vested in its success, how that has a, a lifting effect of the whole organization. You know, the, the ownership effect that we talked about earlier does make a difference. As I say, if it changes your emotional um, relationship with the, the organization, even if it switches things, you know, you know one or two percent or even less, it's that little bit of magic. Companies succeed and fail on the 
on the notion of one or two percent of, of magic or or not and if ownership by your team of a small proportion of that can help then why wouldn't you take it why yeah. should everybody bust a gut to make you rich yeah uh, that pixie dust is important with those things. Now, it's an element related to this, a uh, company not far away from where I am now, sadly not going to be a public company anymore, it's been bought up, um, was Fuller's Brewery. Um, yeah. And family, good family business. Um, uh, but they always used to have, uh, as a lot of the brewers used to, they had their uh, shareholder day. And that, of course, what it was, an excuse for damn good piss up, uh, on the basis that they then got free beer for the afternoon. And the quality of the questions declined throughout the afternoon. Um, but actually, Beer aside, what it was was actually they had actually created a, a consumer loyalty, sort of way beyond their normal sort of um, the, the, their various pubs and outlets and things like that, which was quite astonishing. And the most um, uh, memorable one, which sadly again doesn't exist, was P and O. Uh, P and O, and used to get your discounted ferries. Remember the days you used to go on a ferry over to France, um, and uh, they were incredibly popular to the extent that actually you saw people, uh, saw uh, brokers actually producing booklets of share benefits that you could get uh, from companies to try and create that sort of loyalty. That's sort of gone out of fashion now. Is that something you'd ever see coming back? And uh, would someone like Oliver actually benefit from that? I'm not quite sure what loyalty you would have with a urine test, but I can see something. I, I can certainly uh, see it happening. And we see people using that at the moment. We've got uh, uh, companies rewarding their early stage customers with with, with shares just as a thank you. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing tool. You, you think about, let's say it's a car company, for instance. Um, you know, the first uh, 100 customers get, you know, 100 shares uh, as a thank you. You know, the next time they're at a dinner party or a barbecue, you know, if it's an electric car, you know, conversation, we all know people similar to ourselves and we conversations come around. Why wouldn't they say, that, you know, why don't you try these these guys out at, at uh, Fuels Included or wh whoever it, it might be? That advocacy is absolutely real and it's really, really powerful because, yeah, uh, and you should recognise, you know, any business, especially early stage businesses, yeah. without their early advocates. And, you know, in Oliver's case, it might be uh, certain clinics or certain... Yeah. Uh, uh, um, well, if, if you, let's, let's turn around. Them. Oliver, what's your view on this and have you done anything to follow that through? I must admit, it's a really, it's a really good point. Um, and I think uh, traditionally in the medical world, it's a, it's a con conservative market because of the nature we're dealing with, with understandably important issues of, of people's health. Um, those that are engaged in it are generally well-trained, thorough and conservative people. So actually the practice is very much that traditional approach. Um, and, and actually it's been one of take, I think, from the medical device manufacturer from the industry, whereby you would utilize them and their QDOS and their research and then use that for your own commercial gain. But it's a lovely thought, actually. I know we, we may have a, um, a number of key high profile hospitals that we're working with and actually working with them and utilizing the research that comes from those trials will help us commercially. But what a, what a lovely way to, do, to, to, to make them even keener, incentivize them with a few shares or, or other options, really. I think there's a caution, sorry, just no, go, something just to be cautious about, given the medical environment, the ethics of it have to be careful. So it's not a, 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 a if you do that, you get this. It, in, in your case, it may well just be a, as a thank you for being our early uh, stage partners or whatever, and that in of itself will still bear fruit. But there's loads of different ways of, uh, of doing it, but you, you should be very careful about the, the ethics. Of, of I would agree with you. The NHS is um, a difficult, difficult commercial place to operate sometimes. One issue I did come across in a company actually down in Kent, I was fascinating there. They were concerned about uh, supply chain risks, trading risks um, and consistency in supplies. And one of the things they've done is actually link up with local suppliers um, and actually uh, had a small uh, share it's a share proposal at this stage that if they did actually maintain a, a relationship um, so they had priority delivery over others, um, that they would actually include them in the in the shareholder uh, register somewhere. Um, which is an interesting idea, but again, you're quite right here, if you the, the ethics of doing that, but equally the opportunity of saying, I could actually put more certainty in my trade routes um, if I've actually got part of these consumers, actually, or suppliers, actually part of the business. Or do you think that's ethically wrong? I think 
you, you have to, having people vested in the business comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but you, you should think about it in the context of who the counterparty is. But Okay, I've got a question coming here from Lexi Williams. It says, uh, based on your comments in relation to employees having equity in the business, would you suggest that holding share capital is preferable to making a business either fully or partially employee owned? If so, why do you think this? Or, or do you think the future of businesses will be employee share ownership? Um, if you, could you want to have a look at that one? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the, the notion of fully employee owned businesses um, is great but they're very different uh, uh, models to the sort of flow that we have. So if you look at a, a John Lewis type structure, the, the, the people who contribute to that business uh, or are employees at the time will get a share of the dividend in that year. So it's quite good for a company that's already in a stable place and those who are in there during their phase will, will have some, so, some ownership and some share of the dividends, but they will lose those once they move away. As soon as they leave the, the company, they'll lose that right to, 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 the, to the dividends and the distribution of profits. In early, earlier stage businesses or those that are still growing or there's a, a different dynamic, you know, that reward doesn't work. That reward mechanism doesn't work. And the ability to trade the actual share rather than just cash, uh, take a share of the profits each time is very different. Let's say you, Oliver, uh, Oliver is a great example. He has somebody who joins him now for the next year or two uh, in some strategic role, and they bring in a massive change that changes the organization forever. That sort of skill set is not necessarily needed forever. But if that person has helped to make a material change, they should be able to walk away with that reward that they've uh, created and, uh, and help, uh, help to, to build, even though the fruits of that endeavor or that contribution may not come to fruition for a few years in terms of uh, profits or distribution of profits but they've still earned that so they should be able to walk away with those shares so the the, the distribution of equity the democratization of, of equity is something that we're absolutely absolutely committed to and believe in but there are lots of different ways of doing it and you know full employee-owned uh, enterprises uh, can work sometimes you do need that driving force to, to, to move businesses forward. You do need uh, different leadership set up. So there are horses for courses, yeah. Justin. Uh, I think it's just finding the right one for, for the business. Yeah. I was fascinated. I was up in Sheffield uh, last year and seeing some of the business there, uh, quite sort of old, well, old fashioned business, steel business. Um, and uh, Sheffield still produces an awful lot of steel. Um, in fact, actually by value, it produces more steel than it did 40 years ago. Um, but no matter. The point was this, it was actually a specialist firm you know, about uh, 350 employees and it's a co-op um, and it's one of those old terms that you thought of sort of apart from the cooperative um, you know, store in the, on the high street you sort of died out but the sound when I was doing a bit of research there's about 250 300 of them still around um, and not sort of old let's say older businesses but actually have been designed like that but you highlighted the key point about how do you come in and out of it um, and how do you get that reward um, Oliver what was your what would your view be in terms of saying actually have the employees in here completely, the whole, all of them. Wow. Um, I mean, we're a small company and um, I would, I think I, I very much as a result of this conversation and, and my subsequent ones with IFTI have been me uh, now aware of a number of options that I perhaps hadn't considered in all fairness. Um, it would have been the traditional route. I think we've got a small, very passionate team at the moment because they're loyal to to, to me and they believe in what we're doing is ultimately as a healthcare company that's doing good for patients but it would be um most certainly would be keen to explore other other options as you as you say historically it's always been the more senior individuals but i generally know that the the operator that that puts the product on the line is, is just as important with our with our very small business too absolutely so i think um we need to we need to make sure that they're, they're fully recognized and some of the schemes you, you mentioned could um, could be appropriate I found it frustrating on occasion. I had one business that was taken over by a large bank, um, and we'd always been keen to make sure that uh, staff were involved as much as possible. And in fact, particularly, it's actually up in Glasgow, um, the old fashioned mail, mail room 
you don't get mail rooms anymore, um, but uh, all sort of delivery elements and things. These people were passionate about the business and wanted to be involved in it. Um, but of course, when the bank took over, that went completely against their principles. Um, and so it was it's a pity that that was actually lost. Uh, it was fascinating creating that sort of vibe and interest uh, and an issue that was actually wasted there. Um, let's move to one other question I've got here uh, from an anonymous attendee, right? Some people say that you should hang on to your equity. Why do you feel this is the wrong approach? Well, hanging on to equity, I think hanging on to it is probably quite a good approach, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, personally, I mean, it's uh, the lifeblood of the business. It's, it's valuable. It, 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 you, you should never give it away, certainly. But if you think that you're the only one, yeah, you may have put a lot of endeavor and over, we've talked about the different stages of, uh, of evolution of a, a company and uh, the risk reward. But if you think that um, everybody else there is there just to help you get rich uh, as the founder or the investors of the business, I, I think the, the world has changed. And, and certainly uh, uh, that notion of, you know, somebody busting a gut to get that report out or to get that piece of stuff through the production line, just to make sure that you, you get your money. I, I just don't think it works. I, I think it's a corrupt uh, philosophy. I think everybody who's part of making a business succeed should have their, their, their piece of the reward commensurate to, to their contribution. And everybody's different. You know, I mean, this stuff started off uh, over in the, the States, as I said, back in the 80s, uh, the research that was done and Silicon Valley is built on this. So everybody from the janitor to the v, v, uh, vice president has some shares. They're different amounts, but everybody is vested in it. And so, I'd, be, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on, um, on on how that approach. If you take a company like Dyson, which, as far as I'm aware, is still entirely owned by the Dyson family. Yeah. Um, and yet they've obviously achieved great things, incentivizing their staff without any any dilution. Um, I welcome yeah. your thoughts. How, uh, how, that, uh, how that approach has happened? I guess I I, I don't know that story or how they uh, reward or recognise their their teams in other ways. They may well have some sort of ghost share structures, so that the they may not actually give actual shares, but they will have something that maybe mirrors the the, the shares uh, or some uh, options that are, uh, are converted in terms of cash. Uh, remuneration based on the value of the enterprise. So there are a number of different tools out there that are based around the uh, actual um, growth and value of the enterprise. The, 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 as I said earlier, there are horse forces in this sort of stuff, but I do feel that uh, it makes a big difference if you can actually hold on to that thing and walk away with it when you've done the job. But I mean, they've clearly done a, a good job of however they chose to do it. Um, but yeah, even the, you know, I, I started life at, at BP and you know, after the first month or so, I, I had shares in it and I still have shares in, in it, good or bad. But, uh, you know, it, it's um, it, it's one of those interesting things. It's a really powerful tool. Let me bring in that uh, slightly overused acronym now, ESG, uh, you know, Environmental, Sustainable and Governance. Uh, in terms of shareholder structure, that probably comes under the governance element. Now, to me, actually, governance is actually just running a business properly, the right way to do it. But of course, now this has actually gone a slight stage further in that certain investment houses, and you don't want to necessarily overplay this, but they're certainly going to try to get as much promotion as they can out of it, the likes of uh, Legal and General, um, and Fidelity and others, uh, and uh, Aviva, actually, most recently listening to, that they would actually part of their investment selection uh, would be dependent upon actually the governance of that company and part of the governance would be how the shareholder base is being selected, developed and changed. So this is now something which is not just you know, a company thing nice to have, it's got external reputational issues as well. Um, and so something that uh, I think the issue with Dyson is fascinating because it is seen as being Dyson's business. Is that actually the right sort of governance? Um, if you must see some examples of, of this coming through, where governance has worked properly with it, and where yeah, it's a bit more questionable. Yeah, I, I guess with the the companies that we work with in the main, um, their uh, you know their, their governance is, is led by their their founders, uh, uh, and or, or uh, and augmented, I guess, as they get more sophisticated investors coming on, whether they're angels or VCs. Um, in, in terms of the reputational aspect, it's interesting. I think so many of the, the businesses we, we work with are, are 
with this um, uh, interesting uh, beast known as millennials. And these folk who are now actually leading businesses, I, I suspect Oliver may well be, be one of these uh, creatures himself. They already have an instilled and an inbuilt um, uh, mode of assessing the rights and wrongs of businesses. And I think this piece about uh, the distribution of equity, the democratization of uh, equity is something that feels very rich, uh, very strong in there. And most, most of the, the, these folk you know, want to have, to have a part of what they're, they're helping to create. And uh, just fascinating that you see how, um, I'm thinking of examples with uh, companies like Virgin and others where they, where they occasionally went public, um, where their reputational uh, issues were, were affected. Um, and so it does run quite a risk there, but I suppose at least with this ESG coming up, there's more chance of getting companies, there's a better reason for them to behaving properly um, and being more open as to what's going on rather than this uh, opaque attitude of, well, this is uh, information we don't need to actually show to our competitors. Um, ESG, I know, Oliver, when we were discussing things, this was an important thing for you. You're doing the right thing in the right way in the right industry. Um, and it can be, it must be, I thought it must be very frustrating sometimes when you're coming across other people. I don't, you have direct competitors doing precisely what you're doing, and people who actually don't have that same attitude of the right way to do things. Yeah, I, I think, first of all, I'll take the compliment that I'm a millennial lifty, uh, and unfortunately not. Um, I think just you're that, just fulfilled as a creature either. I think we can probably give you a sort of humankind, probably. That's very kind. Um, so, Justin, I think um, the medical device sector is extremely um, regulated and, and there are very few small um, competitors in, 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 in medical manufacturing as such because of the high setup cost. And with medical devices, you have regulatory requirements and with regulatory requirements comes governance, governance and good practice. And that good practice really comes all the way through physical product on the production line, where does it come from? How does the operator interact, engage with that? All the way up through to the higher corporate structure. So I think it is an industry quite rightly that is heavily governed and I believe it, it, it should remain so. Um, I think the two are slightly different though from, from um, where we sit with incentivizing and, and, and shareholding. Um, but I think generally good practice is, is common in the medical device sector, albeit the, the interesting recent story of uh, Theranos um, in America um, open, opens up a really interesting story about ethics and, um, and uh, conduct in the medical device sector. Yes, I would have thought that's uh, going to be a, a case study for years to come as to uh, how you can easily fool an industry, um, uh, uh, I say fool an industry, fool of some uh, actually quite sophisticated investors as well um, to get away with that one. But it is a, a, an issue now that ESG people are, uh, certainly I've found investors now, which would have been, ESG would have been something five, six years ago, a nice to have. Uh, here's my portfolio. Oh, better have something that's green in here as well. Now, actually moving now to centre stage. I want to make sure my portfolio uh, fulfills this requirement. So I've now got companies saying, I've, I've got my definition of ESG. Um, if you must then come across an issue whereby companies have a view of what, how they should be behaving and what they should be doing, that may be different from what um, you know, potential shareholders and larger investment companies, particularly institutions, may, may be looking for. Yeah, I think certainly when it comes to um, ownership, the, the, it's interesting to see the different types of folk that, that come to us. There's those who are philosophically aligned with us and therefore know that the real success is going to come from everybody being part of the journey. And there are those that are, are being told to, to come to us because their, uh, um, their VC um, needs to know that the, you know, the, the option pool has already been diluted into the, uh, into the numbers before they, they uh, uh, putting their money and that, that thing that they know has value is going to be looked after. Um, in terms of um, the whole philosophy of, uh, uh, of transparency, it's actually quite uh, amazing how much more transparent and yes, the, each company will have their secret source of value, etc. But there's so much more sharing. And I guess for so many people, it's about trying to get uh, airtime and visibility and the level of sharing actually helps them 
Yeah, it's just an interesting comparison. I appreciate this just shows my age. In terms of being millennial, it's probably the wrong millennium. Um, but uh, when we had the dot-com boom, and we had uh, uh, deeply patronising uh, to them, but nonetheless, a bunch of kids coming along saying, I've got a, a, a dot-net company, uh, which is going to be going to do some um, uh, rather sad sort of uh, small software thing. But as far as they're concerned, anything which had you know, dot-net on the end of it, this is like a float on the market quickly. What are you going to be doing? I'm going to be selling it off and keep the money. So very quickly, when offered the opportunity to be able to actually uh, raise money for a business, they looked, you know, there was very little ESG. It was, give me the money. I don't care about the shareholders. Now, I'm pleased to say most of those failed dismally. Sure. I'm slightly concerned now that we're getting to hear more as more tech businesses coming through. Obviously, the, you know, the, the uh, recent uh, tech market prices have gone down dramatically. But the enthusiasm for small tech businesses will mean that there'll be a lot of money chasing fashionable tech businesses, which won't necessarily have that uh, the right attitude to it. If the, how can you as an advisor, us as investors, uh, make sure that we're getting the right company with the right attitude? Yeah, I guess firstly, I just need to clarify, we don't give advice. Yeah. Uh, you know, being a regulated business, we have to be very careful of the, the words that we use. We certainly guide people in what they can and can't do in relation to equity. Um, but when it comes to um, the, the whole notion of uh, um, you know, pulling, uh, so if you can just repeat the front end of that, Justin, because I, I... Okay, no, the whole idea was actually said that you know, how shareholders, companies uh, coming to market, and uh, far as they're concerned, they're just going to be selling it off, shareholders get dumped with the shares, and they're just take the money and run. Uh, that was the story. And increasingly, we're beginning yeah. to see the tech businesses, small tech businesses, being influenced by this sort of greed rather than necessarily real uh, attitudes of growing wealth. I think there's two things there. Firstly, the, the amount of information that's, uh, that companies need to share with prospective investors. Um, there's a much larger, um, con people can do a lot more searching. I mean, yeah, there are examples where people's People have been uh, had the the wall pulled over their eyes, uh, and you know on a quite uh, mega scale in some cases. But with things like regionally, for instance, the amount of diligence that they will put together in the information packs to help people understand the business that they're investing in, I think is really important. I think the other side of it is that there is a lot of money. I mean, we we we've seen it in the number of companies that we have on the platform and the number the amount of investment. There is a lot of money and some of it's quite ill-informed, shall we say, or uninformed. Um, some might call it dumb, but there's just a lot of money out there. So it's, it's not, not surprising that people are looking for things that yeah. are a punt and, and might help them. But I think um, the importance for real investors rather than those that just got money to throw is to okay. look at the information. We're coming up to the end of our hour now, but I just want to ask you both. Um, Oliver, uh, I'll ask you, um, but you come in second, but I'll just put the question to you. Um, give us one bit of, the, uh, of advice, an opinion, a view, you would say to prospective uh, co companies looking to raise more money and have shareholders. What's the one thing you would tell them to look at from the experience you've had so far? Um, and Ifti, same question to, to you, given the experience of you've, you've had with this, what's the, the nugget you could try and give people? Ifti, I could start with you first. Yeah, I, I think the, the key thing is to the people. So the, the, the company, the, the founders, the, the team are critical and what they're actually looking to, to pursue. So if the team are credible, they're relevant in what they're, they're doing, they have uh, the, uh, an idea that has has legs um, that you can see that it's solving a real problem. I think that's the the, the key to, to 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 investing, and, and that um, that I think is self evident with uh, Oliver and. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, and Oliver, uh, assuming therefore your customers have legs, despite with their urinary problems. Um, but uh, what's the element that you would tell people? Here's a bit of advice that I would uh, uh, give people go, to go through the same service system. I mean, uh, from our perspective, we have a number of doctors that have actually invested in our business, which is lovely because they understand it. They're in that sector. Yeah. Um, I think from our, if, I, if I'm picking an investor and have the luxury of picking an investor, it's very much the... Um, the the experience and the breadth of their own personal network 
Um, I've pulled a lot of those, as I mentioned earlier, into the business, including our chairman, our investor director, and some of our other investors. I actually talk to on a daily basis, utilize their team, their resources, their engineers, and a lot of knowledge share happens between businesses. And that's really how I've allowed our, ultimately what is quite a small company, to have a, a far greater reach than it should do. That's fascinating. It is that power of the team, isn't it? I've always found in businesses, recruit people who are distinctly more intelligent than you. In my case, that's not difficult. Um, but actually surrounding yourself with an enthusiastic team of people, uh, which is then recognised externally, frankly, gets a lot more confidence building than, say, just the, um, the entrepreneur who's showing off um, how good they are at everything. It's a team thing. I think the other thing, Justin, is it, it very much shares risk, shares responsibility. So often in a, in a small technical company, there are technical challenges. Yep. And by the time you pull those individuals in and their networks and the subsequent people that they know, yep. a problem, a, a, the old adage, a, a problem halved is a, is a problem shared. And that's um, problem shared is a problem halved. And that's absolutely correct. Yeah. OK, that's I think it's a very key point. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. I hope you found that helpful and get some issues out of it. Uh, equity is vital for business um, because it is the ownership, it's the development and it's the future of business. And remember, in Britain, we're setting up more small businesses than France and Germany put together. Um, and we're good at starting them. I have to say, financing them in the middle range, um, we're not very good at. And I hope that's where us at Regionally going to come in to help at some stage. Um, and there's a lot more development needs to be done. But without the underlying investors and having the right investors in the right businesses, um, that is absolutely crucial. Getting the right team, but with the right uh, money behind them, all facing in the same, same direction and having uh, aims which are at least compatible, if not necessarily always the same. Uh, if the, Oliver, thank you very much indeed for your time today. Really thank appreciate you. that. We're recording this. Um, please do feed through any other questions that you have. Be delighted to get back to you. Uh, but thank you very much indeed for your time. And um, may I wish you, well, hopefully a very good business year uh, and hopefully one that's going to be improving uh, as hopefully we come out of the pandemic into something more better to actually have something which is going to be a slightly warmer summer um, and hopefully a healthy one as well. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Goodbye. Yes.